Good morning, my name is Jack Holt, the Minister of Polworth Parish Church. We are now able to gather again for Sunday services within the building, but we continue to offer this online service for those of our members who cannot attend, but also to those who have joined us over the previous weeks of lockdown and want to continue to be part of our fellowship. We hope that you will continue to be able to participate in worship through this service. We used our Harvest Thanksgiving service as an opportunity to renew our Easter candle that could not be dedicated on Easter Day. And so as you watch me light this candle that reminds us that we worship in the presence of the risen Christ, I ask you to respond to this greeting. The Lord be with you. We have gathered in God's holy presence, the one who etches grace on our hearts. This is the place where God will transform us into disciples. We glorify our God who yearns for justice, not just for a favoured few, but for the least of our world. This is the place where God will write compassion on our souls. We give thanks to God for unceasing grace. We remember God's persistence in saving us. This is the place where God will breathe the word into our lives. And so, let us worship God together. We sing the 100th Psalm, All people that on earth do dwell, but to a new tune that I have composed. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Himself with mirth, his praise foretell, come ye before him and rejoice. Let us pray. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, receive our praise. Yours is the wisdom that brings forth being from nothing and order from chaos. This wisdom you have displayed in the constellation of the stars, the motion of the planets, the turning of the tides and the carousel of the seasons. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, receive our acclaim. Yours is the wisdom that guides the ways of all living things. This wisdom you have displayed in the colours of nature, the sensitivity of the senses, the memory of experience. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, receive our admiration. Yours is the wisdom that draws humanity to its ultimate destination. This wisdom you have displayed in the inner depths of consciousness, the endless search for meaning, the comprehension of transcendence, 
the restlessness in our souls. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, receive our worship. Yours is the wisdom that sought and saved humanity from itself to reach that higher goal. This wisdom you displayed in your incarnate Son, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, in the timing of his birth, the obedience of his life, the sacrifice of his death, and the power of his resurrection. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, receive the glory you are due. Yours is the wisdom that now dwells within our hearts and minds. You display that wisdom in the purity of our spirits, the desire to be at peace with everyone, the gentle way we treat others, our willingness to yield, the continual turning to mercy, and the constant reaping of good fruits shared with all, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. Merciful and forgiving God, how then can it be that we have not been wise but foolish? In the chaos and uncertainties of life we forget your ordering of all creation. In the snares and deceptions of life we heed not sense or conscience. In the drudgery and routine of life we lose sight of heaven. In the desire to live better we rely on ourselves and not on Christ. In our estimation of our worth we measure with the values of this world and not by the indwelling presence of your Holy Spirit. Merciful and forgiving God, forgive our foolish ways. People of God, hear and heed these words. Your sins are forgiven. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And by God's doing, not yours, you are in Christ. Therefore concede control and let him renew your minds and transform your lives. Almighty God, you created the heavens and the earth and made us in your image. Teach us to discern your hand in all your works and to serve you with reverence and thanksgiving. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from the Old Testament and is contained in the book of Zephaniah. These are the words of another minor prophet who was active early in the history of the two nations of Judea and Israel. Like his near contemporary Amos, he uses the phrase the day of the Lord to describe the coming judgment of God that was to befall Jerusalem, a consequence of the nation's moral decline and abandonment of God's law, and which is expressed again in poetic imagery. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not be good, nor will he do harm. Their wealth shall be plundered, and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The warrior cries aloud there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities 
and against, against the lofty battlements. I will bring such distress upon people that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his passion, the whole earth shall be consumed. For a fool, a terrible end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. As pants the heart for cooling streams in parched and by. So longs my soul for you, O God, and your refreshing grace. As pants the heart for cooling streams. So longs my soul for you, O God, and your refreshing grace. As pants the heart for cooling streams. So longs my soul for you, O God, and your refreshing grace. So longs my soul for you. The second reading is from the New Testament and is contained in the Gospel according to Matthew. The second of the concluding parables to the portion of the story that has described Jesus' earthly ministry is called the parable of the talents. To our ears, this is a word that indicates a person's particular abilities and skills, which would have been foreign to the original hearers of this story for in its time the word related to weights and measures. It describes the largest weight against which any metal such as gold, silver or copper could be measured. For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me 
two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, good morning. Today I want to begin by describing to you four films from different decades, different stories, but one thing in common, they are all based on true life events. Coach Carter is the story about a man who took over a college basketball team and the manner in which he not only took them to success on the court, but also that what made the film into uh, the story into a film was the manner in which he sought to try and ensure that these students would also be prepared for life. Many of them thought that their future was pretty bleak because they were not academically good, but he knew that unless they worked hard, their futures would be more limited. And so he made it a rule that they could only stay on the basketball team if they kept their grades up to a C or more. As they began to win, he discovers that they've let their uh, academic aspects of their time fall behind. And he makes a decision. He closes off the basketball court. He stops all the games. He stops a winning streak by this group. He evokes the ire of their parents. He um, has his own employment called into question, put before a tribunal. All of this to try and ensure that these young men would have a better life. And they recognise that this is what they must do to succeed. And so they do turn back to their university, their college courses, they raise their grades. And then at the end of the story, we're told how many of them went on to do good things in life. The second story is sort of similar but different um, to Sir With Love. is a story about a black man in the 1960s who goes to be a teacher in a school where, again, a lot of social deprivation. And the most senior students about to leave really have been given up on and they don't care about themselves or about their futures. And again, it's about how he takes them and requires of them to look at each other with respect and to see themselves as young adults in the making and to instill into them values that they can live by and again he falls foul of both the students themselves who resist 
what he's trying to do. The teaching staff who think that he will fail. Um, and so at the end of the film, likewise, he too has demonstrated that he has turned them about. I'll come back, as I say, to these stories in a moment. The third story is Spotlight. It's the story about how a group of reporters uh, managed to unmask the depths of hidden child abuse that was being done in the Catholic Church in their city. They were again finding great resistance. There was a lot of people in positions of power and responsibility who who fought against what they were trying to do, but they were doggedly determined and they unmasked this and and forced the Catholic Church to admit what was going on and to put their house in order. The fourth story is All the President's Men, based on, again, dogged reporting. This was not aimed at the Catholic Church. This was aimed at the government of the United States of America and the Nixon presidency. The well-known articles in the Washington Post by Woodward and Bernstein were what brought down President Nixon and his government uh, with the infamous Watergate tapes. And again, these two reporters met all forms of resistance as they sought to try and unmask the truth that would have this effect. And in the end, due to their having a an editor that was also about truth rather than anything else, the story was eventually presented and all that was being done exposed. It, it, there are stories here about college and high schools, young people in different parts of the world, about exposure and th- of corruption, exposure of abuse. And if you lumped them all together and then brought in every other aspect of society, you would have what Zephaniah calls the day of the Lord. Because that's what the day of the Lord is. It's about God finally bringing about in the world the end of all that is wrong with it. And for those that this would mean the exposure of their faults, those who would have their corruption revealed, those who have participated in the things that have brought down the moral fabric of society, this is not a day that is to be looked forward to. But there's also the sense in which it's also about God lifting up the people who have been at the bottom of the ladders of life, who have not been given their due place and respect, and that they are shown to be people of worth, integrity and righteousness. All of this is taking place in the mind of the prophet. This is what they are looking forward to. The day of the Lord will not be a day that will be welcomed by all. In fact, might not be welcomed by many. But at the end of the day when it's over, all things will be put right. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, as the psalmist declares. The day of the Lord is a day at the end of things. In Christian terms, through the cross and resurrection of Jesus and the coming into the world of the Holy Spirit, we have been given a foretaste of the day of the Lord unfolding. And as we come to the end of the Christian year, we again will be looking at the reign of Christ that will mark the end of all things. 
and start the season of Advent by remembering that we are awaiting the return of Christ that will signal that the day of the Lord has finally arrived. The day of the Lord, when everything is put right. But what about now? And what about us that are doing the waiting? What role do we play in our lives? And the answer to that is found in the parable in the second reading. This parable, which, as I said in the introduction, has nowadays been taken to mean that it's to do with people with more abilities than others, was actually about something to do with weight. Weight. A talent was a weight. C.S. Lewis wrote an essay which he entitled The Weight of Glory. As I said in the introduction, you used a talent to weigh gold or silver or bronze, depending on how heavy the metal was, depending on how much you got for your talent. But the weight of glory. This parable speaks about people who have great weights of glory resting upon them, that God has given them the opportunity in this world that it belongs to the Lord to reveal that. The weight of God's glory has been given to them, invested in them, that they might reveal it in the life that they seek to live. Some people have demonstrated that their weight of glory was at the level of five talents, in the sense that their impact on history has been marked and remembered. There are those whose weight of glory would be two talents, in that they had made a substantial contribution in their day, but perhaps society has not remembered it to the same degree. But there is nobody who does not have the weight of glory upon them. And a a talent is a lot of weight. It's the difference between being given 10 kilograms instead of 10 grams of something. It's a substantial weight. And we have all been given that opportunity to allow the weight of God's glory upon us to be revealed in how we seek to live. But unfortunately, some of us are like that one talent servant in the parable. Instead of getting on with doing something with it, we actually look at the character of God and we say this, I'm not really anybody. I don't have anything to offer. I am not somebody who can do much about anything. And we can put that down to a whole series of reasons. In Coach Carter, the first film I described, there is a boy in it who is always resisting what this coach is trying to enable him to become. And so his coach keeps asking him a question, what is your greatest fear? And he backs away from that. He won't won't answer it. Until towards the end of the film, at that point where they have recognised the need that they have to ensure that they get their academic grades in order, the coach again looks at this boy and the boy gives him his answer. And what he does is quotes from a book by a lady called Marianne Williamson. And it's a quote that's actually become associated with Nelson Mandela, although he wasn't the originator of it. And he says in his answer this, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate, Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? 
You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people don't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. There is a weight of glory upon us all. And if we do as the parable does, if we simply bury it and don't seek to let it be revealed, if we don't invest in it and let it invest itself in the world, then we are just letting ourselves down and God along with it. For as the old hymn says, where Jesus bids us shine, we are just leaving our small corner in darkness. The day of the Lord is coming. The arc of the universe bends towards righting all the wrongs, all the injustices, all the inequalities, all those who have been complacent uh, and amoral and don't think that there is a, a, a judge who is there to mark all that's going on. If all the people who have gathered their wealth and their possessions and their privilege and their power and just lived on it, all those people are going to find that that is going to be exposed and eradicated. And all the humble and all the poor and all the seekers of righteousness, they shall be lifted up. And as Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. So think in this week to come, let your prayer be God, reveal to me the weight of glory you have placed upon me. Show me who I am. Show me how I can shine. Show me how I can turn my one into two or even into five. Lord, we commit ourselves to trust you and to listen for your voice in the midst of the world's clamour for our attention. We commit ourselves to obeying your word and to seek always to live for your glory. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and empower us with your grace that we may make and keep this promise. We will give you our best, not our second best. We will give you our heart and not be half-hearted. We will give you our time, not our spare time. We will give you ourselves to become your people. Amen. A chance to sing again the hymn God Who is Almighty Word to the tune that I have composed. God who is Almighty Word Chaos and darkness heard And took their flight Hear us we humbly pray glorious ray let there be light Saviour who came to bring on your redeeming wing healing and sight health to the sick in mind sight to the inly blind to all humankind, let there be light. 
grace and in earth's darkest place let there be light blessed and holy three glorious trinity wisdom love might boundless as ocean's tide rolling in fullest pride through the earth far and wide let there be light our prayers for others today have been composed by one of our elders Astrid Telford who has to remain shielded because of her own underlying health issues and we appreciate her words for us today and so let us pray O God our help in ages past our hope for years to come be our guard while troubles last at this difficult time we pray for our governments that they have the wisdom to design restrictions to keep us safe we pray for our nation that collectively we have the strength to abide by those restrictions and protect each other. We pray that the media provide us with facts and developments whilst not increasing our anguish or raising unrealistic expectations. Father, we ask you to continue to give strength and comfort to those experiencing the heavy burden of self-isolation, bereavement, fear, loneliness and despair, loss of work and income leading to an uncertain future, pride which does not easily allow them to ask for help. And we ask you to keep safe in your arms those for whom the pandemic merely exa exasperates everyday struggles. Those living in war zones, in poverty and in refugee camps. With the impact of abuse, chronic illness and mental health issues with little or no access to medical care. Those suffering from discrimination and oppression and those experiencing the aftermath of natural and man-made disasters. We give our thanks for those who help to lift that heavy weight from the shoulders of others by demonstrating their compassion in practical ways those unnamed and unsung heroes who finance and distribute food and other essential items to those in need, contact the lonely and brighten their day with a simple chat, provide safe shelter for those fleeing from terrorism, persecution and abuse, continue to work in war zones, disaster zones and third world countries setting aside the risks to themselves. We pray that when things do not go our way, when we are left with heart in our hearts, that we have the grace and strength to move forward and unite together, recognising that our strength lies in being part of a compassionate community. Help us to sustain and build on our reawakened altruism by continuing to think of the safety and welfare of others first, acknowledging the benefits this brings to not only the recipients of our kindness, but to ourselves, our community, our nation and our world. In these days of darkness and gloom, help us remember that days that are dark and cloudy are usually followed by days of bright sunshine, 
and that we need the rain of those cloudy days as well as the sun. Help us to stay safe and positive in the knowledge that one day we will look back and remember how this crisis reinvigorated our community spirit. God, you are our help and our hope for years to come. And hear us as we continue to pray in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We close by singing the hymn, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy, to the tune that I composed, which hopefully now has become familiar to you. There's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in His justice, which is more than liberty. There's no place where earth's sorrows are more felt than in God's hand. There's no place where earth's failings have such kindly judgment given. There's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in His justice. Which is more than liberty For the love of God is broader Than the grasp of mortal mind And the heart of the eternal Is most wonderfully kind There's a wideness in God's mercy Like the wideness of the sea there's a kindness in His justice, which is more than liberty. If our love were but more simple, we would take Him at His word, and our lives be filled with glory from the glory of the Lord. There's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea, there's a kindness in His justice, which is more than liberty. There's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in His justice, which is more than liberty. Our worship has ended. Depart in peace. Lord God, we ask for your blessing so that as we go back into our daily living, we remain committed to you in faith, sustained by hope and enabled to live in love. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you to know his peace. And all the people replied, Amen. Our thanks again to everyone who has joined us to watch and participate in this online service. A reminder that we also now live stream the church service on our Facebook page and if you can access Facebook at 11 o'clock on a Sunday, we would be delighted to have you join in that service as well. This online service uses the same readings, the same prayers, the same message, but due to copyright infringement possibilities, uses different hymns. 
Next Sunday is the last Sunday of the Christian year. We call it Christ the King Sunday, or the Reign of Christ Sunday, after which we move into the new Christian year with the season of Advent. And so I look forward to sharing that service with you. Until then, please remember that we are in these restrictions to save lives, to re Reduce the pressure on the NHS and so asking everybody to just look after themselves, to look after others. Keep safe.